Okay, so next up we've got Alistair and he'll be talking about Docker. Uh, we can have audio visual on the side, please. Maybe. There we go. All right, can everyone hear me? Yep, sounds good. Excellent. All right, so I'm going to get started. Uh, and fair warning, this has all been fairly last minute hacked together because as it turns out, my topic is basically the last two combined. So we're going to be focus I'm going to focus a little more on the Docker specific parts and less on the, the crazy we're going to deploy cloud native apps at web scale, et cetera, et cetera, business. So before we get too far, who am I? My name is Alistair Chapman. I'm AGC 93 basically everywhere. Uh, my job is actually I'm an information security engineer. Um, I do a lot of different work as well though, and I do a lot of work with containers. Worth pointing out, this talk is me, don't complain to my boss if you disagree with me. Um, this is what I'm hoping to get through, but with a fairly short time slot, it will be fairly rushed, so hopefully I can get through as much of it as I can. So we're going to be looking a little further into monitoring in the same sort of lines as Elizabeth was talking about, as well as adapting team processes and tools, uh, a fair bit on the security of containers in both small and large scale deployments, and the overall view of how to integrate Docker into your platform. This slide up there was from a presentation someone gave a few years ago and has been great. Docker doesn't so much have a learning cliff as it does a learning giant overhang that's totally and completely unscalable to most people. Um, we're suddenly changing from the environment where you have a couple of servers that might be running a web server here or there, and maybe you'll you know, have a few VMs and that really ups the density, and containers takes it to a whole new level. Uh, it's not difficult to have very large, um, as Nick was pointing out, very large servers running hundreds uh, or thousands of containers, and trying to manage the complete stack from, yes, Docker at the bottom, but all the way through that monitoring, supervision, configuration, discovery, uh, how your actual application scale in those environments is a lot more complicated. Um, and likewise, as Liz pointed out, it's quite tricky to get the balance right of the login and the monitoring and the security of your hosts running your applications compared to the application themselves. Sure, it's pretty easy to go into your application, integrate some logging, have full request information, all the service logging you want. But if you're not also logging information about your host, you're not going to notice when someone less savory breaks in and starts using it for Bitcoin mining and you'll wonder why your response times are pretty rubbish. It's also pretty tricky to identify those areas where your fancy new container cloud native infrastructure hooks into that giant great DB2 mainframe you've got hidden in the basement no one likes to admit is there. And trying to get those interface points correct is not as easy as it sounds. I've seen uh, environments before where they've genuinely had network throughput problems from all of these thousands of containers outputting logs and metrics and performance monitoring over some poor decrepit little Cisco switch that was in no way prepared for that sort of throughput. And making sure you have that full stack view of I'm suddenly going to drop in thousands of hosts or even when you're starting out a few dozen hosts per server compared to the old way of doing things is not that easy. I've got the mention there of herding cats, and that's because a lot of people will start with containers, and a lot of environments will go, go to their developers and say, do you like containers? And the developers say, I love me some containers. And so you'll spin up something, and a lot of people spin up something like, say, OpenShift, and all the developers see is this massive stack of one-click installers. I can just click this box and bam, it's going to give me MongoDB, it's going to be Django, <laughs> it's going to be great. And I'll start spinning stuff out just like mad. The more proof of concepts than you've ever seen in your life. And you'll end up with hundreds of databases scattered on whether it be a, a proper cloud platform like OpenShift or Mesosphere, or even just the good old Docker Hub, where you'll see developers start to just pull down every random platform they can get their hands on. The problem with Docker containers is that developers can get their hands on anything, and they will be running anything before you know what's happening. So keeping some level of control over those cats that you've suddenly unleashed upon the world is a bit tricky. And as we'll get to later, it's also a bit of a nightmare for security people like me. So it's fairly important to understand the approach you take specifically, I find, with monitoring. Because you are going to have that situation of developers suddenly spinning out everything. And if you can't see what they're doing, or if you can't see especially what your own production services are doing, you do have a problem. Um, this one's fairly similar to what Elizabeth was saying about CollectD, so we're going to breeze through it pretty quickly. This is what a lot of environments will start with. They'll have some giant monolithic application, because we already know there are no green fields, and that'll point to somewhere logging information. And that's great. 
And so you'll start to put in some containers. And the containers, you go, ah, I just point in my login server. That should cover it. The problem becomes when those four containers in that diagram becomes 15,000 containers. And suddenly, your logging application, you've completely and totally lost all the information you actually wanted in amongst a giant barrel of noise. And you'll log on to your login, and apparently, you'll, you'll see, oh, there's, there's some performance events. I should check the dashboards. Check the dashboards, and apparently, you have 150,000 un unacknowledged performance metrics because you had one container that got a bit carried away. So trying to keep track of both old school monolithic infrastructure and containers can be a bit tricky without a pattern like this, which is the most common one I've seen, but there's many different ways of solving it, of something to allow you to distill the, the massively different scale of, contain, of information of any kind you get from containers back into something you can actually action. Um, so you, and you have very commonly get it with both the network team, disk team, security team, everyone running the underlying platform will often want to know what the hell is going on. But if all they're being inundated with is 50,000 request log messages a second, they're not going to be able to tell anything. So it's important to make sure you can distill and filter out the things you actually want to know. And as we get to those platform teams, the, pro the case is going to come at some point, something is going to go wrong. And as I pointed out, you'll go, ah, there's a network problem. So you call your network guys and say, there's a network problem. Your network guys log onto the server and go, let me just list out the VMs. Oh, there's no VMs. Let me just list out the web servers. There's no web servers. Oh, that's no problem. It's all good. Send it back. Because of course, if your response teams aren't prepared for the fact there's containers involved, and you haven't prepared your teams with the tools needed to handle container issues, you're going to have a really bad time. That's when you start having to pull developers out of bed at 3 in the morning to try and ask them why on earth they were running 50,000 Nginx containers with the same index.html page. And the same tools and processes don't apply to containers. It's pretty easy when you're running web servers, even massively scaled web servers, for a network team to keep track of what's going on. When all of that is hidden behind the extra layer of abstractions that um, especially full-on container platforms bring, but even just Docker at its most basics, it's not always the easiest. So it's pretty easy to have a look at a server. And this is an excellent tool I like to use called Dockly. And it can be running containers or locally or anything. And what you get out of this is a nice overall dashboard view of applications. And you can quickly grab all the logs out of them. If your team aren't prepared with tools like this, they're going to have a particularly bad time. Because when you're looking through process information, it's all going to look different. Um, anyone who's had a look at the output of top running Docker containers can tell you that everything looks similar, but not quite the same, especially when you bring in resource constraints and limits. Um, and I've seen particularly Java developers have this one. They'll fire up a, a, a Java microservice for some reason, and you'll see that they'll start hitting out of memory exceptions, and the process will get killed. But they'll look at the metrics in the container, and it's fine. Because the container sees the 48 terabytes of RAM that you've got on the host and goes, cool, I can use 46 of those. Of course, if your container has a limit on it saying you can only use two gigs of RAM, the container has no, the Java application has no idea that's going on. So it's very easy to lose things. Especially with vanilla Docker as well, it's pretty easy to lose things because as fun as it is to have uh, Nervous McNulty as your container name, it doesn't really tell you what's actually happening. And so all of these are running on my local machine. And if we, for example, try a, just running a nice little CentOS machine, we'll see it gets added. And then we spin up a process. That's not good. And that's going to have a pretty noticeable impact on your host and the other applications running on your given host. I challenge you, based on infallible Volhard, to work out what is taxing all that CPU. Um, and in fact, Docker does give you the tools for that. But if your team aren't aware of what the tools are to do that, then it's not going to be particularly easy. So I can tell you that the problem here is that root is running yes. And that's the only process running in the container. So I can pretty confidently kill off and follow Volhard, and suddenly when we fire up CDOP again, everything's much cleaner. That's 30 second fix for someone having a runaway process going on a host. Pretty simple stuff, but unless your, tool, your response teams are prepared for the, the wondrous new world of containers, it's not going to be anything like that simple. My personal area of specialty, so I've been talking about this for a bit, is security. This should be an absolutely basic requirement. When you plan out your container deployment methodology, or even when you're just trying out some Docker things, heard about that Docker stuff at a conference, get an entirely wrong idea, and go home and figure you can put all your databases in containers. The first thing you should, I'm sorry, one of the first things you should be considering is security, because it is 
not the same as it's been before, which obviously is a bit of a broken record at this stage, but it particularly gives you all the keys needed to blow giant holes in all of your existing security infrastructure. Um, I take that as someone who has to look after security infrastructure. Containers are a nightmare sometimes. Um, and way too many developers, for example, will just go to the Docker Hub. And I mean, it's all well and good when they're pulling off official images. You pull down the official Redis image, it's probably pretty good. But then they'll see that, oh, so this, this user has created another Redis image, and this one's even better. It's got config pre-baked, done. Let's pull that, run that, done. Of course, they have no idea that it's just cop every now and then. It's just sending all of your API keys off to the internet, and the developer never actually bothered to check that. For some reason, when containers are involved, devel developers start trusting the internet. Why anyone would do that in 2018, I don't know. But developers seem to think that if it's on Docker Hub, it must be safe, and it's just not. Fortunately, containers are one of those ones where, from a security point of view, it's caused all the problems, but also gives us quite a lot of solutions to it. Uh, Sysdig, which came up before, also has a product, and it's a little bit tricky to read, I'll admit, called Falco. And Falco is this nice little thing that hooks into all the syscalls and events generated by Docker and lets you define rules like this, where I can say that no containers should be reading device files that shouldn't be in the container, or nothing should be trying to access hardware devices that have been mapped in unless we already know about them, and even simple stuff like um, sending outbound connections where they shouldn't be coming from. Now, those rules are probably things your security team's already looking for, but with containers, it's a lot harder to find them. Because the containers get created and they disappear almost immediately afterwards, it's often a bit of a trick to actually track them down. Now, there is also another excellent project um, by the name of Cap Capsule 8, and it lets you create a sensor, and the sensor runs on your host, it's all in Go, and it will let you look out for all those syscall events. Oop, doesn't like that. Ah, oh, sorry. Look for all those events happening on your, on your host so that when you start doing things like running random BusyBox events, now obviously that is an absolute ton of information that you would hope you have some sort of seam to look after, gives you more information you'll ever know what to do with. And tuning that is a big part of the challenge, but you can't say that Docker lacks the visibility. It's just a very different approach to visibility as traditional host-based and network-based um, security tactics. So security is not just a case of, hey, cool, I can do some container stuff now. You still need to do the basics like behavioral monitoring, network-based detections. Sure, if you have containers running your infrastructure, you should probably still be looking out for 50,000 containers getting created in AWS and immediately going to connect to a crypto coin miner, because things are probably not going well in your AWS infrastructure, if that's the case. Uh, user controls and role-based access controls are very important. If you're just using plain old Docker, you don't have a lot of role-based access controls apart from what's offered by your host. If you're running Kubernetes post 1.8 or half a dozen of the other um, orchestrators, they'll usually give you role-based access control you can configure to a very granular level. Which brings me to the overall, because I think we're running low on time. So the solution is not a Docker. You can keep throwing Docker at the problem, and as much as I generally joke about this, if you keep throwing Docker at the problem, you're not going to get a solution. You're actually going to get more problems than you had before. What Docker lets you do is build your own solution. Using that same massive learning cliff we talked about earlier, if you actually get all of those things right, you will get to the nirvana, the wondrous world of stateless infrastructure, the same sort of thing that Atlassian's working on with Kit. And as is the case with Atlassian, they've obviously sat down and worked out what was necessary to get over that massive cliff. The answer isn't the technology you're using. The answer is how you integrate that with the existing infrastructure, how you prepare your teams to deal with that, and how you work the infrastructure into a larger application area. Obviously, to start with, it's nice and easy to work with Docker, but over time, you're probably going to want Swarm, Kubernetes, OpenShift, whatever. And understanding the platform and the APIs you're using is absolutely critical. Containers are not turnkey. They never will. And thinking that you can throw Docker at an application and make it work is not going to get you very far at all. It's important to build your stack, build your overall solution, as Atlassian have done, around both sides of your infrastructure. Yes, it's fun to have nothing but stateless infrastructure containers in AWS and how good's the cloud. But at some point, there's going to be databases. At some point, there's going to be mainframes. There's going to be monoliths. There's going to be things you can't upgrade. And having those still integrated into the same infrastructure, or vice versa, putting the logs, the security output, the monitoring of your containers into the same place those are going, and still retaining that actionable insights you get from that is an absolutely crucial part of bringing Docker orchestration into your existing applications. That's all we've got to say. I think we might have time for a couple of questions. Nope, we're out of time, but I, you can come find me at any point afterwards, and I'm happy to talk about this. Thank you.